start with the topic of the session, getting started with Blazor. So uh, this is something about me before getting into the discussion. This is something about me. I work as an associate software developer. I'm a C-sharp partner MVP, and I primarily work as an uh, .NET developer. Apart from that, I work around Azure and UiPath uh, to build RPA solutions. And these are the ways, uh, these are the places where you can reach me out and uh, have a conversation if you uh, want to discuss anything on this topic. So uh, let's dive into the agenda for the session today. So first, uh, we will discuss about how web development happens today, then what is Blazor, then what is WebAssembly, then what is you know, uh, let's, uh, there are two flavors of Blazor uh, which are available and Blazor Wasm being official in the uh, recently concluded .NET Com. So we have two official uh, Blazor versions ship, uh, shipped with .NET 5, which is Blazor Server and Blazor Wasm. There are some other experimental flavors of Blazor available in which you can make desktop application to using Electron and Blazor. And there are some other things too, uh, to make, you know, native applications. And we'll have a demo on uh, building a component. Uh, forgive me for this error here. Then we'll see how routing happens in uh, Blazor. Then we'll debug and Blazor server application. Then finally, we'll be deploying the uh, application which we'll be making in this uh, session to the cloud, to Azure. So these days, what happens is that most of the uh, web applications uh, typically have a backend as a, uh, which is normally an API which is uh, normally built on .NET Core Web API if you're a .NET developer, or else you know you can make it with Django or else Spring Boot if you are a Java developer, or you know any other any other thing like Node.js too. You know you can make uh, Web APIs using Express.js, uh, which is again is, is what we say uh, a trim framework of Node. Then you have a front end uh, in which you bind your those APIs and get the data, and uh, you know you do all, a lot many stuffs in the UI. So this can be React, Vue, Angular, Servlet, uh, and you know there are a lot many JavaScript frameworks. So this is this is the thing how application development actually happens. You have a backend API, you have a frontend, you know, client side application made on Angular, React, Vue, you know, which has components which are binded to each of the API and any changes over there acts like that. More like an Ajax panel, you know, these components are more like an Ajax panel. So what is Blazor and why should we be excited about this? You know, so uh, Blazor uh, allows a .NET developer or just any developer who has some background knowledge on C Sharp and .NET, you know, has some working experience with, uh, you know, uh, Razor, you know, uh, in making uh, ASP.NET MVC application, he can do, uh, he can make client side web applications or you say as a single page application SPAs or PWAs using Blazor. You know, you'll be a full stack web application. Uh, you can make full stack web application using .NET. So Blazor gives you these capabilities. And uh, if you want to know uh, why did they keep the name as Blazor since uh, the markup language which we use to, you know, uh, make our UI is basically Razor, which is again, you know, a combination of HTML, CSH and uh, you know, uh, CS, uh, C sharp to write the logic. Uh, so B from the browser and Acer from, you know, the razor. So that's Blazor. So what is Blazor? This is a formal definition. Blazor is a component based UI framework which lets you build web UIs using C sharp, HTML, and CSS instead of JavaScript with the help of WebAssembly. So uh, as I said in the previous slide, now you can uh, you know, be a .NET developer and also call yourself as a full stack developer, which has been what we say as a buzzword these days and is a requirement everywhere. Everyone needs a full stack developer. So the problem was that you, know, uh, you needed to learn so many things and uh, the world of JavaScript is ever growing. You know, uh, every year there are two releases of Angular, uh, when I started, you know, way back in January, when I was exploring Angular, there was Angular 9, then Angular 10 came in mid. Now Angular 11 is coming up. So, you know, coping up with JavaScript frameworks has been really difficult. And you can never know which framework is good for you. And everyone works in a different way, you know, working on React is different. You know, they uh, use something, a mixture of HTML and tags, you know, uh, JavaScript tags, you know, to make applications in Angular, you use TypeScript, then, you know, the, the whole component model is really complex to understand as a novice to start with. But 
if you have worked with web forms or else uh, you have worked some uh, you know somewhere in asp.net mvc application uh, you know while making some of the views using razor you have some good grip over there right uh, so as a dotnet developer it will be difficult for you to actually grasp some other language you know javascript is something common that everybody learns but uh, getting into a framework is sometimes difficult so blazor comes in and helps you out to make a client side web applications or an spa or pwa you know progressive web apps with the help of uh, your existing knowledge base of c sharp so i said you know uh, blazor does that by the help of web assembly so what is web assembly now another new word you know web assembly is a new type of code that can be run in modern web browsers and provide new features and major gains in performance so what happens is that uh, your javascript code that you write you know what happens is that there is a sandbox inside your browser in which you know there is a git which uh, you know uh, compiles the what we say uh, the bytecode uh, that is generated from your javascript parser right so what wasm does or web assembly does is that it uh, you know it allows every high level languages to you know um, use their existing what we say code base to uh, uh, write code for the web uh, for the web browser so how does it does that you know uh, web assembly is kind of a format if you can convert your what we say uh, code to a wasm format and give it to a browser to execute it will execute but the problem was that you know how how would you convert uh, your existing in the case of dotnet you have dlls right when you uh, build an application you get dlls and everything out uh, when you publish it right so how do you convert that into wasm that was the thing now uh, you may ask a question can i you know can i use python to do the same thing how blazor is doing with the help of wasm absolutely but you need to have a compiler you know which compiles a code to a wasm format which can be you know again used by the git uh, jit of your you know uh, of your browser sandbox environment to uh, interact with the dom so this is how web assembly does that and uh, web assembly came into existence in 2016 when some of the major uh, what we say uh, browser makers or who makes browser you know like microsoft edge or else google chrome microsoft uh sorry firefox mozilla firefox all of them they actually came and the, they say that you know we are going to have a standard uh in which you know you can compile and uh, run any high level languages in the browser not just javascript it just give you the leverage so uh this is what it is uh, there is a, there is a problem here still you know uh, only the browsers which came after 2016 are supporting wasm you know web assembly so i'm saying it as sort for wasm but uh, you can uh, just Make make sure that there's web assembly. Uh, there shouldn't be any confusion. So uh, after the uh, all the browsers which came after 2016 supports web assembly. So if anybody is using Internet Explorer, and, uh, you know seven, eight, or else Firefox version below 52, then you know uh, this thing is not going to work over there. But still, there is a work around how we can achieve that in Blazor. You can use polyfills and use Blazor server over there. So that is something I'll come later. So now since we are clear about uh, what is web assembly and what is blazor let's look at the hosting models you know uh, there are two official uh, hosting models supported right now so one is blazor server and the other is blazor web assembly so let's see what is blazor server so blazor server is uh, is an hosting model uh, um, you know uh, that is offered by what we say blazor which decouples component rendering logic from you know a ui updates happen with the help of an signal r connection and it uh, uses the browser as a thin client and uh, communicates a real uh, uh, communicates with the server with uh, with this particular socket having a real time communication with all the updates or events that is happening in the browser so what happens is that uh, blazor is a component bo uh, based model like angular or uh, you know uh vue js these are all component based uh, framework like right? uh, spa framework so blazor is also a component based uh, framework so what happens is that when an individual component uh, renders it uh, generates a rend uh, rendering uh, render tree so it has all the events or, you know all the things that is there and any change happens there then this can uh, then there is a change in the render tree and there is a diff uh you know uh, the difference uh, what happened in the browser whatever the event happened there is a, a difference uh, between what is there in the uh, server and what is there in the browser and what happens is that uh, in blazor server you get a blazor.server.js file which and uh, 
which then uses this signal or connection to update uh, in the server. And if any changes has been done in the server, it gets back to the browser and then the render tree uh, gets modified. Then, uh, you know, all these changes uh, reflects back in the browser. But uh, the problem with a Blazor server is that you need an active internet connection. So if you don't have an internet connection, then, you know, uh, working with Blazor server is not a good idea. But the advantage with uh, Blazor server is, you know, I'm saying everything over there, there is a slide dedicated to advantage and disadvantages. So let's look at the advantages first. The application loads much faster, you know, uh, because the uh, initial load size uh, uh, of your, uh, what we say, Blazor server application would be something around 400 to 500 kilobytes. So it's faster to load can take full advantage of the serverless ca uh, server capabilities because you're uh, hosting this place server application uh, in an, uh, what do we say, uh, IIS, uh, if, you're, if you have your uh, own servers and you're hosting it over there, or else if you want to host it in Azure, you can use app service with an ASP.NET Core uh, runtime stack, and you can deploy it. You can take full capabilities of your server and use it. Next, all the client needs is in browser to use the app. You are not much dependent on the browser's capability, uh, but we'll come uh, come to another place where we are uh, dependent directly on the browser and depend on its capability to, uh, you know, uh, to support the functionalities of your application in place of Bazaar. So it is more secure as the app code is not sent to the client. So this is an important point. So what happens is that uh, in Blazor WebAssembly, all your DLS also go uh, go to the browser. And then again, that is compiled uh, into the Wasm format. Then it goes. So all our DLS are there in the server. Anyone can, you know, it is possible to actually uh, re uh, reverse engineer your uh, DLS to get back the logic. But you know, that's the thing. That's that's why it's not safe. But here you can, you know, your code would be secure because nothing is being uh, sent to the browser. N uh, none of the data is being sent to the browser. Your application code stays in the server itself and only the response is being sent uh, through the signal or connection. This is all about the advantages and benefits that Blaze server provides, but there are also some disadvantages. You know, a SP.NET Core server is required. So you need to pay money for that. This is going to be a bit expensive because you need a full blown server. An active connection to the server is required. You need to have a proper internet connection to, uh, you know, interact with the server and to you know reflect the changes in the render tree and uh, in the DOM, in the browser. So higher latency due to a round trip, uh, the diff, uh, whenever an event happens, there is a change in the render tree and that diff is being sent through this uh, signal or connection to the server, then the server again sends a response back. So you know there's a round trip involved over here. Scalability can be a challenge because you know in a single screen, there can be multiple components. Right, uh, suppose I have a few charts and that is one component. Then there is a search, uh, what do we say? Uh, there is another component which has some search criteria and then uh, another component which uh, shows the result depending on the criteria we selected in the search component. So every, each component over here in the screen takes its own uh, signal or connection. So right now, if there is a single user, he is going to uh, use at a minimum of three signal or connections. So scalability can be an issue if you're going with, you know, a uh, full blown application, which is supporting a lot many users, but the drawback can be countered by using Azure Signal R uh, in that you can, uh, you know, uh, you can uh, address this scalability issue. But problem is uh, cost again comes into the picture. You need to pay some money to use Azure Signal R service. So the same complexity involved over here. Now, the most exciting thing that is there for, with Blazor is Blazor Wasm. It started, uh, you know, the Blazor was an experimental project uh, made by Steven Sanderson on, uh, you know, uh, in 2017. So uh, initially it started with the you know, WebAssembly model, but later the, uh, you know, Blazor server model came into the picture and it was uh, somehow boxed as the first official release. But in, with .NET 5, we did get Blazor Wasm, uh, you know, launched with .NET 5. So right now, if you have a Visual Studio, uh, uh, Visual Studio 2019, which has a version of 18.6, you know, uh, the latest one, if you have it, you're gonna get it by default. You're gonna get the Blazor Wasm templates by default. But earlier you had to, you know, uh, manually install it. Uh, so there was some complexity involved, but right now there's no concern like this. 
okay so the way how blazor server works and blazor wasm works are quite different blazor server uses uh, uh, you know signal or connections and uh, uses the browser like a thin client for the interactions with the dom but blazor wasm what it does is that it uses web assembly here so what happens here is that uh, there is a uh, when you make a request for the first time what happens is that uh, all the dlls of your application along with the .net.wasm comes to the browser and then this .net.wasm which is actually uh, at the mono runtime which has been compiled back to a wasm format and uh, uh, that is sent to the sandbox of your browser then that compiles all your dlls and uh, establishes you know the connection with the dom so here all your dlls are being sent and is being compiled by the dotnet wasm then you know all the binding happens with the dom elements so this is how blazor wasm works now there are a lot of advantages that blazor wasm has you know you don't need an active internet connection even uh, you know in the middle your internet connection uh, you know fails you can definitely uh, work around with blazor wasm so it is a very good uh, what we say a uh, very good uh, uh, alternative to make pwas so the client resources and capabilities are used uh, you're not now you're not dependent on the server right now you know you can use the browser's capabilities uh, and the, you know if your uh, system has a good amount of ram and all the resources are available you can do some resource extensive task uh, in the browser itself you don't need to have a what we say uh, Uh, what do you say highly scaled up server to handle all this request and do all this high performance task you can do all those things in the browser itself you don't need a full blown asp.net core web server to actually host it so uh, what i mean from this is that you can uh, host it uh, using github pages or else any static hosting site uh, which you can come up with you can, uh, you can host it there the next is uh, it can yeah that's the thing which i said it can be hosted in your own server cloud cdn you can put it also in an azure cdn to you know actually deploy it uh, just the way how we uh, what we say how we uh, give our contents like images or documents or else like you know javascript files which we minified minified javascript for how we make it available uh, to our uh, applications right now you can use in cdn to do that there are some disadvantages with blazor wasm you know the first uh, request that you make uh, to you know get this particular thing can can take a bit longer because you know you're downloading all the dlls like an application have multiple dependencies so there can be a lot of dlls your business logic dl uh, the dls which has your business logic the dll of the dependencies uh, which you are using in the application then this dotted or wasm it is actually and what we say uh a compiler dot net runtime compiler uh, runtime compiler you can say that which is converted to a wasm format so a lot of things are actually being downloaded so the first request is going to take longer but this is only the one time post that all the requests will be near uh, native speed so restricted to the capabilities of the browser since we don't have a server we are not dependent on the server's infrastructure uh, all the processes that you are going to run all the performance issue will be uh, you know uh, will uh, all the uh, what do we say all the performance will be dependent on the hardware of the client here the client is the browser so if uh, you have a good system then you know if you are doing some performance intensive tasks then it's pretty much good to go but you have a uh, what do we say your infrastructure of uh, the application is not that good then you know there can be some hiccups you know uh, yeah that's what is capable client hardware and software is required the software part is more or like i say right uh, any browser which was launched before 2017 is not supporting blazor wasm sorry uh, web assembly so if web assembly is not there in the picture blazor web assembly uh, you know fails down but uh, to support those uh, web browsers you can definitely use blazor server so blazor server uh, offers you this particular capability so let's have a look at a sample blazor server project so before going into the uh, demo uh, are there any questions not from my okay okay let's create uh, since there are no more questions let's see how to create one
Okay, it's taking a bit longer because uh, you know I have a lot of workloads installed here. That's why it's taking a bit longer. Okay, so once it comes over here, you can just select Blazor over here and get that. Uh, yeah, you need to install the ASP.NET Core uh, workload. So I'll just show it to you. There is one dependency that you need to have. Uh, the first one is that you need, uh, you know, a Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio 2019, uh, to actually, you know, uh, have this Blazor support, and you also need to have uh, the .NET Core. Uh, 3 SDK installed in your system. So that's one dependency that you have. You can also, you know, install that with the Visual Studio installer. So just, uh, is it coming? Yeah, it okay. came. I'll just show you the workload. You can just uh, install it to get the Blazor templates available. Okay, it's still taking time. Okay, so I'm using the community edition. You can, you know, you get all this thing in the community edition itself. Okay, the workload which you need is this one. This one over here, .NET Core cross-platform development and the one over here, ASP.NET and web development. If you have these two, you're good to go. Okay, so since uh, we are clear with the dependencies, let's click over here. Let's give it a name. Test. Now we'll be getting, you know, two options to select. One would be Blazor Server and the other would be Blazor Wasm or the WebAssembly app. So we are going to go with the Blazor Server app. So, okay. There are some features uh, that came with .NET 5, but uh, this demonstration would be more on .NET Core 3.1. Uh, so let's click on Blazor Server, okay. You can enable Docker support. You can also deploy uh, your Blazor Server application in a in, uh, Docker instance. Uh, you can also deploy in Kubernetes. Uh, Vivek could be the right person to guide over here uh, related to Kubernetes and Docker and uh, the WebAssembly part. So here you can see that there are two options. ASP.NET Core hosted and progressive web application. So if you select PWA, you'll get some, you know, uh, add, uh, what we say, the default template that we uh, get with the Blazor WebAssembly app will have some more, uh, what do we say, uh, components added, which enables, you know, uh, the support to interact with, uh, lo uh, you know, local DB of your browser, then the session DB, to all those things. That's the basic thing. Uh, you know, some boilerplate code would be there. If you select ASP.NET Core hosted, then what will happen is that you'll get in uh, Web API as well as, uh, you know, Blazor Wasm template, you know, some boilerplate code, you know, the default code which we get uh, when we try to start an API, you know, th that thing will be there along with the uh, boilerplate code of WebAssembly app. So here we are going to start with for Blazor Server app. So once we create it, look at the project structure and see, uh, you know, how things happen. Once we're clear about the project structure of a uh, Blazor uh, server application, we're gonna create a Blazor Wasm and see uh, the performance thing that, uh, sorry, uh, the initial load uh, that I was telling, I was referring to. So if you work with an ASP.NET Core application, uh, the project structure should look a bit similar. We have a program.cs, which, you know, configures uh, our hosting and everything. It sets up our server, primary and Kestrel server. Then it also instantiates a startup class. In the startup, we define all our dependency injection and we, uh, you know, uh, what do you say? Our, our middlewares are also arranged over there. Everything is over there. Uh, just uh, let me say a brief. Let's see it in a brief. This is the dependency container of our application. So here you can add your dependencies, like if you have uh, an instance and uh, you don't want to you know, create an instance every time, you can just utilize one instance of that particular class and use it. So you can absolutely do it over here. Uh, so you can see that we have added a dependency of uh, uh, add freezer pages. So this allows us to you know, uh, 
use the Razor pages uh, to uh, Razor components to actually um, build our UI along with the logic. The server side Blazor comes with an add-on that supp uh, to support our application to run it as a Blazor server app. This is the uh, pipeline middleware pipeline. And uh, the both things are pretty much similar with the .NET Core app. Uh, we should look at this. This endpoints are map Blazor Hub. Uh, what it does is that it sets up the what we say uh, signal R connection. You don't need to do a lot of thing with that. Uh, Blazor does it, uh, you know, under the hood for you. You don't need to set up the whole signal R connection and everything. So the fallback page, uh, the fallback page is the host. Uh, host you can see. So let's go and see where the host is. So the host is there in. Uh, okay, the host should be there in the www root. So uh, it initialized the whole thing. So the most important part that we should be looking at is an is a index pages. Okay. So index is the starting page. This is basically a component, as you can st uh, see with the extension index tracer. So oh, uh, you might be thinking, you know, just the index page is a component. Uh, where is the layout being done? So if you have some experience with ASP.NET web forms, you might know we had something called master pages where, you know, we set out a whole layout and the mockup and everything kind of uh, kind of that, you know, your structure, your, uh, you know, web app, suppose uh, you have a web app which has a footer and a uh, you know header and a footer which are common for all the pages. So you define all those things in a master page. So the layout page is something like that. So in the layout page, we have uh, a navigation bar defined over here. So uh, this navigation bar is again a component. So you can see over here, map menu. So here we have all the, what we say, all our navigations and uh, the things associated with that. Like uh, so by default, we have a fetch data. We have an counter, we have a home. If you click on home, you'll be redirected to index. index. And, uh, this, these are the basic navigation. Suppose you wanted to add one, you know, you want to redirect to a particular component, you can absolutely do that by adding it over here. So uh, the folder structure has some sense, actually. There is a reason why the uh, why main layout, nav menu, and the survey prompt are there on side, and some other components are there in pages. Suppose uh, there is a component which are used in uh, you know multiple components or as multiple pages. Uh, in simple words, you can say then you should put it on share. Now, uh, let's look at uh, okay. Let's go, uh, let's go back to the main layout. You can see there is a body. So in the body, our components are rendered. Now, uh, there is one more thing, app.razor. This app.razor is something which is responsible for the routing of our application. Suppose uh, you have clicked on the navigation bar for a particular, uh, you know, to go to a particular component to redirect it over there. And uh, you have given it in the, in the HRF. So what happens uh, if that particular route is being matched? And if it, uh, what happens if it is not, uh, if this particular route is being not found, what will happen? So this is defined on app.razor. And, uh, and yeah, let's run it and see. Uh, once we run it, I'll show you uh, what other components do. Let's have a peel, look and peel of the application, the boilerplate application, which we get with Blazor Server. Uh, and then look at the code. In the meanwhile, would anyone like to ask any questions? You can see the Blazor server is being hosted in our IIS. Okay. Let's see in the network uh, the number of resources that we actually fetch for a Blazor server application. So you can see that the total resources that we took uh, that were transferred were 72.8 KBs only. And we have something over here. This is a book file. There are you know uh, some engine.json. This is for the Blazor engine. There are some CSS and the bootstrap file for the CSS because we use Bootstrap over there. And there is this thing called blazor.server.js. This is the important part over here. 
this is uh, the file you know the, this is the javascript file again because uh, the problem with uh, wasm is more of a like you know it cannot uh, access with the browser's resources it needs to interact with the uh, javascript apis again so uh, but this is not the case over here this blazor.server.js actually creates our signal or connections so every time uh, there is a change in our render tree uh, a particular request is being uh, is being sent uh, to our server via a signal or connection and that responsibility is done uh, is is actually a blazor.server.js so these are a few components that we get. You know, uh, I have a counter, I have a fetch data. So when I click over here, uh, this thing happens. So let's look at what this component is, the counter component. Stop our Blazor server, go to the counter component. Okay. This is uh, literally a very simple uh, code. You can uh, say, I have an current count which is, uh, what do we say, which is initialized over here. And I have a method called increment count. And, uh, you know, I uh, I want to, you know, increment the value of this current count every time somebody clicks on the button. How do I do that? So uh, normally in a button, uh, suppose we want to have some JavaScript action done, you know, on click, we want to do something. You have this thing called, you know, this on click uh, attribute in which you define the function. And that function does something and, uh, you know, manipulates the DOM. So it's, it's that simple in uh, Blazor. You need to uh, just add, add the rate, on click, increment count. Then this particular increment count method will be called. And the increment operation will be done. So suppose I wanted to do something else, you know, uh, moreover like, uh, what do you say? Uh, okay, let's create a component in C itself, C for itself. I want to create a component which actually, uh, you know, uh, tells me about the number of words I had entered in a text area. So we are going to create a razor component. Details. Okay. Okay. Let's keep it as number of words. Okay. Number of character defined. Okay, I have created an uh, component here. So the first thing that I need to do is that I have some boilerplate codes to save our time. Okay, we are going to create an, uh, what we say, a text area to type things. So let's paste it over there. Now, uh, what we want to do is that we want to, uh, you know, uh, find the number of characters we have ent entered more like a data binding example so you define your variables you define your methods your codes everything inside this particular code you know at the, uh, inside this at the rate code up inside the braces so let's define a string property description okay so now it's defined you can see the swigglies have already gone let's run and check whether our application works. Okay, you can see that here, uh, the, what we say, uh, we are not using bind, uh, sorry, at the rate on click, because uh, the thing is, I want this operation to be done every time there is a change uh, in the text area. You know, every time I click something in the text area, I want, you know, uh, to show, uh, show the uh, description on the length or the changes. Uh, dynamically, it's more like a two way binding example. We can also do that by having a button and uh, you know, uh, having an on click actions rather than define uh, you know uh, the method or else you know we can directly just uh, have a variable with uh, you know which uh, okay which uh, we assign as a description of length. So uh, okay, right now if we run it, we cannot actually uh, see it. Actually, it is a custom component. We haven't uh, you know added a route for this or else uh, we have not even added in, in the navigation bar or inside any other components. So we can't use it. Even if I run it, I, you know, I won't get it anywhere. As you can see, there is visitor, there is counter, there is home. I don't have anything for this component, which I made. So how do I get it there? 
what i can do is that i can uh, you know nest this component inside another component so we have an index component so here i'll be uh, you know nesting this uh, component that we created which was number of character as you can see the intelligence provisors everything uh, and we have added the number of characters so let's save it and we will see that this component is added to our index component more like a child component you know you have a parent component inside of which you can have multiple child components so this this thing is also supported in blazor Okay, it is taking some time because it is building the files, I guess, or it does take some. Okay, there is an exception, null point exception. Maybe I didn't initialize anything over there. Okay, the exception handling also works well. So let's see what happens. Things do go wrong. Okay, the description, the length, everything works over here. Let's keep it as a route and check. Okay, let's uh, add some route. To add a route, you use this directive at the right page, and then uh, text area. This is how you define a route. So let's run it this time. Let's see what happens. Okay, we are using this bind. Uh, okay, again it is throwing an error. View instance. Okay, the component instance. Okay, let's see the details. Okay. Okay. So possibly since I have uh, you know defined it as uh, okay the thing is moreover like I have defined a property I have also binded this property over here but I haven't initialized it so what happens is that uh, there is a uh, life cycle uh, matches in Blazor so every time you try to render a component uh, while you build it so it it tries to compile this so if you have uh, if you haven't you know assigned any value. To this particular property, and you have already binded it. While uh, the first time when it renders is, it's gonna get, uh, it's gonna throw you an uh, null exception, which we uh, were getting uh, right now. So uh, this should actually fix this issue. Yeah, you know, uh, things like this do happen. Apologies from my end. Okay, we got it. We solved the error. Uh, here is. Our nested component, the child component inside our parent component. So let's type something. As you can see, I write and uh, I write something over here. Uh, uh, okay, you can see that you know the number of characters I'm typing in. It is being updated dynamically over here. So the on input uh, event is more like the text change event in JavaScript. You can say. So how do you define the custom event? It is using the bind event, bind colon event, then define the method. Now, how do you bind a property? Uh, you can use at the rate bind and define and just give the property name. Now, the, this is about this. But what if you want to take in some, uh, you know, you wanted to pass some properties by default as a parameter to your component? How do you do that? Now, uh, the first time you render it, you want some what we say. Uh, you want to uh, send something as a parameter. How do you do that? You just define it as a parameter over here. You define the property as a parameter over here. Then what you do is that go to your parent component and uh, click over here, add a space. You can see that you get something over here to give. That is a description. So the description is a property which we uh, have defined here that it will be uh, taken as a parameter. So since we have defined it as uh, we have instantiated it already and uh, assigned 
an empty value to this. So we shouldn't get an error, but uh, we can also give a default value to this. You know, dynamically, when you can pass a value over here, I'll give it as uh, ABC. Let's run it again and see whether we get ABC by default over there or not. It should come. Okay, you got ABC over here by default. So this is how you can pass parameters to a child component. So this is about the basic things and uh, let's look a bit about routing. Since we have already created this number of character as a component and we have defined the route over here. This is the route even if you wanted to, you know, uh, pass in and value over here. You can just click it over here. This is slash then, you know, define the ID then Okay, then let's add in another parameter, then define the property. It's in, then ID. Okay, let's give it as capital I over here. So if you do like this, you know, uh, you, the value that we uh, that you pass in the route will be assigned over here. So let's for the time being not do it because we have already defined the uh, uh, we have already defined our component over there. Let's try to add it in the nav bar and navigate from the index menu instead of just showing it in the in inside an index component. To do this, we need to go inside the nav menu. Let's copy this much. Let's paste it over here. Then what you need to do is that is pretty simple. Just uh, HRF over here. Let's go again to here and copy it. Let's copy it, then again go back to the nav menu. Do it in text area. Then this should be again text area. And let's run it. You see that you know there is an option which helps us to navigate directly to the component in here. We can see that uh, the text area component is there as an individual component over here. Now inside of this, if you wanted to index, uh, you know, uh, sorry, if you wanted to nest the counter uh, counter component, you can absolutely do that. So since we just have some more minute left, I'll go to another project that I had made, uh, which is still not completely done. Uh, but I'll show that to show the debugging experience. Okay, let's run and see. Here I have a Blazor server application which consumes uh, a web API to get the data from a SQL server. So you can see that there are two browsers. Uh, there are two browsers opened over here. So one is for the API and the other is for our Blazor server application. So this was for the API and this is for our Blazor server application. Okay, you can see that we got an image. We got all our things over here. The Blazor server.js and the site and everything, right? Okay, so let's see at the application what it is there. You know, I have a so footer. If I checklist, it's basically a checklist. If I check, if it is, uh, if I un, uh, if I you know uncheck, it goes away. Then if I uh, check again over here, it shows the count. So this is moreover the thing. And if I go and view about this employee's details, there's a loader, and th these are just uh, details. Again, you have a height footer, show footer. Then uh, this is an on mouse click event, you know, uh, you know, wherever you mouse it, it is going to show its X, Y coordinates and everything. And all this data is coming from a SQL server and we are fetching that uh, by the help of an API. So let's uh, see how debugging actually happens over here. Okay, I'm sorry, just a minute.
I shouldn't have clicked on Teams Explorer. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay, here you can see that, you know, I have a razor page and there's a data binding demo based on CS. Uh, you know, uh, the thing is moreover like these are same, okay. These are the same things, you know, uh, in web fonts, we had a concept of code behind files, you know, your UI would be an ASP, uh, ASPX file and the uh, code behind would be an .cs at the end, you know, something like that. So it is pretty much similar to that. So here you can see that there is a simple, uh, you know, a code, just a property. We, uh, there are two properties, name and gender. And uh, this particular thing in for the component base class. And uh, what I did in the data mining component was that I inherited that particular, uh, you know, code to uh, make all those properties that are available inside that class to be available in the Razor component. But there is a better way to do it. We can use partial classes to do that. So, uh, okay. So this is for the employee details Razor component. You can see, you know, uh, the uh, what we say, the mouse, uh, mouse, when I scroll the mouse in the card, you know, in the bootstrap card over there, I used to see some, uh, you know, some of these coordinate values. How I did that was that uh, I, uh, you know, I defined in particular what we say, uh, Lambda function. Uh, this is actually a delegate uh, on mouse move. I used a Lambda, uh, Lambda method to actually, you know, assign the function by coordinate, which comes as a uh, parameter with the event that is associated with this particular uh, delegate method that we had, you know, on mouse move. So you, you can easily get that over here to let's see a bit of a business logic. I wanted to share a bit of a business logic. So the employee list should give me that. Employee list dot, okay, okay. So uh, what employee list does is that, you know, uh, it calls in web API. We, do, uh, we did dependency injection over here. And you know we don't have constructor uh, depend uh, construction uh, or uh, what do you say property injection over here. You need to uh, you know decorate this particular uh, what do we say your inter uh, the dependency that you wanted to inject by an attribute called inject and use it. So uh, you can see that I uh, okay okay I'm calling in web API over here. So let's go to this particular method. Go to implementation. Okay, see here I'm using the HTTP client to actually call this API. I have configured the endpoints in my startup class. I configured the endpoint in the startup class, which is which should be you know HTTP dot local dot uh, you know four four three or three o four, which is the endpoint for my local API. So uh, that's the one I'm calling that from over there. Employee service, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to fetching it. Uh, I'm trying to fetch it out. Let's put my debugger over here and let's reload our application again. When I clicked on reload, it go, uh, goes back to the home one. You know, it tried to get the list of all the employees from the SQL server from the API. You can see I can click on F10 and F11 to go inside. Then, you know, I get the result and I go back. Once I go back, you know, uh, okay. I think I jumped one step. Okay. Okay, so what happens is that initially uh, when your Razor component renders, uh, you don't have any uh, value of your employee. So you are going to get a runtime error over there. To avoid that, you can have a loader screen while your employee list is empty. This particular spinner will go. This is basically a CSS uh, class you can say, which I defined which uh, for a loader. Then once, your data is there, your employee is not empty. You go through a porridge loop and have a card deck. It's basically a card uh, bootstrap component, uh, you know, a bootstrap card kind of a th layout thing. And inside that I have a child component and this child component takes my employee as a parameter uh, and then, you know, shows all the things. And once all the steps are done, you can see all the list. Now let's see the thing I missed over there. 
I have this thing called on initialized async. So the time, uh, the first time your, uh, what do we say, your razor component renders, this particular lifecycle method gets executed and you wanted to assign the employee, uh, you know, the employee property with all the list of employees, you know, that you get from your API. So you're assigning it in the on, initial, on initialized async method, you know, uh, there is a synchronous method also available over there to see that you can write uh, override space and you can see all the lifecycle method that is available. You know, like build render tree, the render tree I discussed, you know, which uh, is used by Blazor Solver to find the diff and do that. It is also used by Blazor Vesum, but in a different way. Then on after render, on after render async, on initialized or parameter set, all those things are available there. So these are some of the methods that are available to you. So this is how you actually, you know, uh, fetch, fetch data from Web API. The, th the advantage with uh, Blazor server is that you can directly actually, you know, use Entity Framework or uh, what we say, uh, or ADO.NET to get the data from a SQL server, which cannot be done with Blazor Vazo. And uh, the advantage that we also get with uh, what we say, uh, Blazor server is that you can, uh, and Vasm is that you can use your existing code. Normally in an entire application, what happens is that uh, you have a business layer, you have a data access layer, then you have your API, then there are some utility uh, layer. So what happens is that you're using all those things for a API. Now, if there are some functionalities which you want to use in your, uh, what do we say? single page application or it's your client application, you can reuse the code over here. So Blazor also helps you in code reusability. So it also saves a lot of time, you know, writing the same code again. What happens with an Angular application is that you define the models and everything in a separate way. Then uh, again, you need to define the models and everything for the validation in the server again, in the server part. There can be some functionalities or some business logic which are common across, but you need to rewrite them because they don't understand the same code because uh, TypeScript is different from C Sharp and that's all. So uh, let's deploy this application. To deploy it, it's pretty simple. Uh, let's go to the TSFT one, which we're using for the demo. So let's click on publish. Click on Azure. Uh, the way we, uh, you know, deploy a Blazor server application is pretty similar how we deploy an ASP.NET code application. So oh, there is an app service which I had created. So I'm going to redeploy over there. Though that was a different app, this is a different one. So let's redeploy it. And to deploy it, we just need to click on publish. <laughs> Sorry. You can see in the service dependencies, uh, signal R is being recommended and you know, the configuration part is actually handled by the Blazor Wasm and the startup JS, but you know, to improve the scalability of your application, if you want to configure with, you know, uh, as a signal R, then you need to do some changes over in the application. So the deployment process is going on. So in the meanwhile, uh, Let's have some questions. Uh, uh, Vivek, are you there? Uh, hello? Yeah, uh, I, I guess some uh, Kashyap has asked, uh, okay, Kashyap has said like he has to drop uh, because he was like, it's a good session, but I have to drop. So I guess that was something happened. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so our application is also deployed. Uh, you can see the text area over there. We can type anything and, you know, it shows over there. So this is the link. Uh, you can also, you know, use it to, you know, work around a bit. We'll share it. Uh, uh, that's all from my end. Uh, I'll stop the screen share and uh, Paras, any questions from you? Probably, does anyone on the chat? Uh, I don't see anything specific from someone, but but uh, 
मुझे सांस के वानी सुनील सचिन गोपाल यू गैस कैन अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ इफ यू हैव टू एंड इफ यू इफ यू वांट टू आस्क एनीथिंग लाइक यू हैव बीन देयर फॉर अ व्हाइल नाउ इफ देयर इज एनीथिंग स्पेसिफिक यू वांट टू आस्क गोपाल इज देयर या आई जस्ट जॉइन 10 मिनट्स अगो आई वाज लेट सो आई डिडंट अटेंड फुल बट आई विल सी द रिकॉर्डिंग बट इट लुक्ड नाइस आई मीन इन द एंड सो आई विल हैव अ लुक लेटर थैंक यू ये थैंक आई थिंक वन ऑफ द क्वेश्चंस आई हैव इज uh we we do see a lot of these sample codes simple sample codes is there is there a, a much larger complex uh in an enterprise class application that we can see i don't need to see the code uh but uh, we can see that it has been built in blazor uh, we we need to get a sense of the complexity and you know the kind of uh, richness that uh, is supported uh yes sunil some of the applications of microsoft are actually being developed on blazor you know uh the code demonstration that you normally get you know within sandbox and en- environment to work on that is actually made using blazor and there are some other organizations uh, which are using blazor but uh, i don't remember their name right now but uh, we can connect later i i can uh, you know sh- uh, share some of the sites which are actually built using blazor yeah that might that might help us sure Sure, I'll make a note of that. Yeah, some of these hello world applications don't really. I I had experiences with some of the other frameworks, the low code frameworks. I have tried. This is not a low code framework, no, but other is... low code frameworks I have and I have tried and gone a little deeper and asked for a little more, you know, richer use case. Uh, things have the experience has been pretty pretty bad. true uh blazor is actually evolving so blazor server is actually good to go for, you know for production application no no we are not looking at server we are looking at the wsp uh, side okay okay yeah. but the basic part is actually still you know uh, i would not recommend to you know make a full scale enterprise application using blazor wasm yet because the initial po- uh, you know page load size is something around 4 mb or something the first request that you make so that is one constant uh, the still stays you know if you are making it cache pre- right it's supposed to be 2.4 mb if i remember but it's supposed to be cached right yeah it will be cached but the first request is going to be uh, a bit longer oh, so okay. that is normally a constraint some people have no i think it's fine we, we are okay with that okay if anyway an enterprise application what we are looking at which is used in by businesses not used by consumers so it doesn't really matter to us true, true. yeah uh, then blazor blazor wasm or server would be good for you Yeah, so we just need to get some sense of its richness. Some somebody who has actually done some significant piece of development on it. I see. I am expecting that Microsoft is probably going to port their Office 365 and all these things eventually to Blazor. That's my reading. But uh, we still need to see someone else who has done something reasonably complex. Uh, sure, Sunil. Can we connect uh, later? Then uh, I'll uh, I'll try to get some, you know, some sites which are actually made using that from few of my connections who have actually working full time on Blazor. There are uh, some of my connections who are actually completely working on Blazor. So I'll just check with them, and I'll share the links with you, which uh, you know some of the application which uh, are completely built on Blazor on top of Blazor. Yeah, that should help you more. That will help. Thanks a lot. Welcome. uh okay this message like scalability can be a challenge and higher uh, let us say but these are not main things which we cannot use in the application just want to make that i wrong to understood using uh vani can you be uh, more specific with that i i couldn't understand to be honest is it i guess that's what it ashwas yeah uh, yeah uh, yes paras there yeah. was one there was one question from vani actually but i couldn't 